When the Law Society of Upper Canada decided to sponsor a one-day workshop on basic problems in evidence, the response was somewhat larger than was anticipated, and the program was therefore subsequently repeated. The workshops took the form of a lecture followed by a panel discussion in each of the morning and afternoon sessions. The panel discussions were, however, a little out of the ordinary. They consisted of a number of short TV scenarios, each of them followed by a panel discussion examining the various evidentiary problems that arose. In the second workshop, the panels were switched around a little so as to give some variety in opposing views. Both sessions were recorded on videotape, and these programs are an edited version of the discussions of the evidentiary problems arising from the simulated courtroom scenarios. I do not think you will find many clear-cut answers to these fairly common problems. What you will find are discussions of some basic but extremely important principles from which solutions are suggested. This program is designed primarily for the legal profession, though we hope that others will be interested and will perhaps gain some insight into the workings of this aspect of the legal system and the way in which the law tries to reconcile conflicting interests. For the lawyers in particular, citations and references will be given for cases and materials mentioned should they wish to make a note of them. There were, in total, four panels, of which two each discussed separately half of the fact situations. On the first day, chairing panel number one was the Honourable Mr. Justice Edson Haynes of the Supreme Court of Ontario. With him appeared Mr. William Poole, QC, practicing in London, Ontario, and a member of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, and Professor Hugh Silverman, QC, a practitioner of many years standing, and now a professor of law at the University of Windsor. Chairing panel number two was the Honorable Mr. Justice Thomas Zuber of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and with him were Mr. Clay Powell, QC, counsel in the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario, and Professor Desmond Morton, QC, who is both a practitioner and a law professor at the University of Toronto. Mr. Justice Zuber also chaired the first panel on the second day's program, and appearing with him on that occasion were Mr. Justice Frank Weatherston of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and again Professor Hugh Silverman. Mr. Justice Haynes chaired the last panel, again with Mr. Clay Powell and Professor Morton as the panelists. As a result of the editing, panel discussions do not always appear in the order in which they were presented. In the next fact situation, the panels pull together some of the problems previously discussed. There may be a fine distinction between helping a witness recall something, allowing him to refresh his memory by looking at notes, and finally attacking him because of a prior inconsistent statement. These steps are discussed, but in the last resort, it may be necessary to attempt to have the witness declared adverse and to cross-examine him on his previous inconsistent statement. The procedures to be followed are outlined, and the panel discusses the advisability of such tactics. The plaintiff slipped on a banana peel and fell in a supermarket. My name is Bill the plaintiff calls one of the supermarket attendants who made a previous statement that he saw a banana peel on the floor but didn't bother picking it up. Now I understand that you were employed as a floor attendant in the supermarket on December 14th, 1972. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Well, on that occasion, do you recall seeing anything on the floor near the fruit stands? No, I don't. No? That's a little different from the story you told my investigators, isn't it? Well, your Honor, I am loath to interrupt, but with respect, my, my friend is cross-examining his own witness. And surely my friend knows that this is highly improper, and uh, he knows how this sort of thing should be approached. Counsel are always 
crediting their opposition with vast knowledge that they know how things should be done and how foundations have been laid, I, I suspect, without believing it at all. But nevertheless, uh, Professor Martin, in the words of the script, how should this uh, sort of thing be approached? The, the, well, it the, certainly, sh sh uh, uh, to start with, it should be substantially slowed down. <laughs> That became a sort of nightmare gallop uh, uh, and got completely out of hand. Uh, the question, of course, if you examine your, your scripts in front of you, they are an accurate transcription of what was said. The question was, do you recall seeing anything on the floor near the fruit stands? And not was, was there a banana on the floor? Or, or did you see, was, was there anything on the floor near the fruit stands? In other words, the question of memory is being brought in. That is, he's being after, asked if he remembers there being anything on the floor. And I think that gives counsel, if the question's framed in that way, it gives them an opportunity at least to treat the matter as if it was a temporary lapse of memory instead of being a recalcitrant, adverse, or hostile witness. Uh, in other words, the question is quite well framed. And I have uh, taken advice on the answer to this question because I wasn't too happy with it. I'm still not. But I am advised that under these circumstances and in the form of that question, it would probably be permissible at that point to thrust his previous statement into his hand and say, does that help you? Uh, and the, the authority for that uh, course of conduct, which I may say I shudder to think of doing myself, uh, is of course the Coffin case, the Coffin reference, uh, where the woman was handed her depositions purely and simply, allegedly, for that purpose, and invited to remember. You see, this sort of situation, it, it, there's, there'd be some merit in doing that, because this witness may be so scared that he said no, when in fact he meant to say yes. What you really want to do is give him a breather, let him relax a little bit, get him back, because what he may want to tell you is that he did see something on the floor. And perhaps the thing I would advise here would be, first of all, to put the question to him again, not scream and yell, no. <laughs> I mean, a, a terrible emphasis added there. Leave the italics out and, and put it to him again, hoping to God that he'll say, what did I say? God, I didn't say no, did I? What I meant to say was yes. That's the best thing. If not, and you're brave enough, you could try the coffin approach and whip this thing out of your briefcase and shove it in his hand before anyone can stop you. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have the nerve, but uh, uh, a lot of other people would advise me to do that sort of thing. Um, then, of course, if he, if he glares at you and thrusts this damn thing back and says, I just told you I don't recall seeing anything on the floor, and furthermore, there wasn't anything on the floor, uh, what do you do then? Well, I mean, if, uh, I think I've said enough. Why not let Mr. Powell indicate uh, what his, uh, he, he's, I think my friend knows the, how this sort of thing should be approached. <laughs> <laughs> First thing, then, in, in our you know, analysis of what should be done, I, I, I agree with uh, Desmond Morton that the, the first approach would be, uh, under the Coffin case, to attempt to refresh the memory of the witness. And despite uh, Desmond's trepidation in thrusting the statement into the witness's hand, I think under the authority of the Coffin case, he should not have any such trepidations, and it would be allowed. Now. We suppose that that doesn't work, and as Mr. Uh, Professor Morton has said, the witness is not refreshed. He simply hands it back and says, this, is, this doesn't help me at all. Now, crown, crown witnesses do this, Clay Powell, don't they, to you? W w what do you do then? I was still looking at the problem here in the plaintiff. He's the sueur or the sue. <laughs> <laughs> We, anyway, we, we, we'll assume your key witness to the uh, crown, it's crime, a, it's Paul Regina. the Crown, yeah. has just not yeah. said what he should. Okay. Well, first of all, um, Your Lordship, <laughs> there's a recent judgment of the Court of Appeal, as yet unreported, uh, by the name of Regina versus Roberts, which was a murder case, wherein the appeal was dismissed, uh, presided over the Lord Justice Haynes, I believe. And um, a situation arose uh, of this sort. A uh, witness was uh, given a statement, and uh, the statement um, gone through on the basis that the Crown was brought to the Crown's attention that really what he was doing was under coffin, sort of refreshing the memory of the witness. And the statement was gone through at some, um, in some detail, sentence by sentence. And uh, the Court of Appeal judgment, and that particularly Mr. Justice Martin, um, is the effect that this was an improper practice 
because really what was happening, it was a cross-examination under Section 9 of the Canada Evidence Act, and um, therefore it can become a, a, a dangerous thing. Um, I appreciate the refreshing of the memory is, is one thing, um, but it can lead to this potential problem, and I think you've got to make up your mind, and if you're going to go then to an application under Section 9 of the Canada Evidence Act. Now then, that then leads me to all sorts of problems. And um, uh, Mr. Ratushny, in his uh, lecture at page 27, 28, uh, quotes with approval the steps that are set out in the Milgard case. And um, they are also uh, reprinted uh, in Martin's Criminal Code by the editor, Mr. Cartwright, step by step. And unfortunately, my problem is I don't, I don't think they're correct. And um, the reason for that is I am of the view that uh, under Section 9 of the Canada Evidence Act, under Section 9, subsection 2, um, when you give that statement, put the statement to the witness, um, let's suppose you're in a jury trial, the jury now um, are out, it seems to me then uh, it is suggested in Milgard that you go through a various series of steps. The judge then decides whether or not he's going to permit cross-examination on that prior statement that's in writing. And if he's going to so permit it, he should then recall a jury. And that should take place. It seems to me that Section 9, Subsection 2 is really a, sort of a condition precedent to Section 9, Subsection 1. It's the first step in having the, or a way in which proving the witness adverse. And therefore, um, it's not simply a section that can be taken by itself. Uh, I know that's contrary to uh, the general practice, but um, that's the view I have, and I'm going to express it. Uh, it's, it's used, that section, sometimes to, and this has been suggested by some, that it's a way of rehabilitating the witness. You're not just refreshing his memory under sort of the coffin rule. You're going through it. You're not going so far as to having him declared adverse, so you still can really refer to him as your witness. But uh, you've got that piece of writing in his hand, and, and you attempt then to rehabilitate him by going through it. If you fail to do that, then you say, well, now the judge, you should consider what's taken place uh, and decide whether or not this witness is adverse and go the next step, and if he be so found, then uh, go ahead and cross-examine them at large and call evidence to contradict them, or as the case may be. Uh, I, I think those are two different sections. I think they arise from the fact that when Section 9, Subsection 2 was enacted, um, I think it was felt that certain things were going to happen to the Evidence Act and certain changes be made that weren't made, and it's left it kind of a screwed up situation, I think. Sorry. Not a bit, thank you. I, and uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Professor Martin what he thinks as well, but uh, if, if I just might make an observation of my own on the way through, uh, I'm inclined to agree with uh, Clay Powell on this one, that uh, for the life of me, I, I can't see on that Milgard procedure why you, cro why you allow cross-examination in front of a jury for the purpose of determining whether or not you're going to allow a cross-examination in front of the jury. It, it's, it's, uh, frankly, I, I, I just don't follow it. It seems to me that the cross-examination contemplated by Section 9, Subsection 2, contemplates a decision being made in the absence of the jury as to whether or not you will allow the witness to be impeached. It's, it's a procedural step. If you allow the jury to witness an unsuccessful attempt, the damage is already done. It would be absurd, I suggest, to allow a cross-examination of this witness to go on before a jury and then say, well, I'm now of the opinion that he's not adverse or hostile at all. You may not cross-examine him. Well, that's, I think, patently uh, wrong. Professor Martin? Well, it, it, it just seems to me that we're into <coughs> a, a rather elaborate discussion on, on and perhaps rather misleading, one of the things that counsel could have done here, depending upon what other evidence he had, was to have responded, oh, so you don't recall that, I have no further questions. Because actually, if he only has this witness to the uh, fact or to the proposition that there was a banana skin on the floor, he's got a shockingly weak case. Uh, 
I mean, what's he going to get out of him if he, give, if he puts the previous inconsistent statement to him? I think the, the audience ought to be reminded, perhaps, that that previous inconsistent statement would be no evidence that there was a banana on the floor unless he now swears that the previous statement was true. Uh, so, I mean, you've, you're very forlorn hope of getting out of this fellow any evidence that there was a banana on the floor, no matter what you do. Uh, I think in many cases better to cut your losses and hope that you've got someone who can remember a banana on the floor. We changed that vignette just a bit to put in both the criminal and the civil connotation. And I think criminally, we encounter it quite often, where the witness certainly has a spontaneous loss of memory. I recall one case where a little girl had been abducted, she was only 12, from the steps of a church by four Italian boys and taken to the Don Valley and raped many times. Her companions ran to the police at the corner and gave the names of the four boys, the description of the car, and the police looked all over Toronto and couldn't find it because it was in the Don Valley in the bushes. In the witness box, they called the boy who'd gone to the police and given them a complete statement giving the names of these people. He got in the box and he looked out at the four accused and he looked at a great number of his compatriots in the area. And he had difficulty remembering his own name. And the Crown started to lead him through his evidence. First of all, he couldn't tell whether he was hearing or not. But certainly when they came to the issue of identification, they wobbled all, he wobbled all over. Well, the Crown came forth with this statement to refresh his memory. Out go the jury, he reads it over, and the Crown can't see them because the Crown is down below. I'm sitting up here looking at him. In my own mind, I think he's not looking at the statement at all. Anyway, he said he'd read it and refreshed his memory, and back he comes again. The jury come back, and he was able to give the identity of two witnesses, and then a complete loss of memory again. So out go the jury, and this time I said, did you really read that statement? Oh, yes, he read it. Well, I said, you didn't turn over the second page, did you? Oh. So I said to the Crown Attorney, you read it to him. And he read it to him. And finally, he identified the other two prisoners. 